So my wife pulled in from work. We had an hour-long drive from work. She went to put her car in the garage. Hour and a half. <laughs> and there was nowhere for the car to go because it was full of roses. Um, but it was a great deal. And I, and so, you know, so, uh, my, so mom and I, we had a ball shopping. And so we were in the kitchen and, and she storms in and she said, well, it's going on in the garage. So I was beginning to explain to her, this is a great sale. She said, you know what? I don't care. Those roses, you have enough roses. They go back. And I was still trying to explain it. She was like, and she doesn't, she's, my wife is very quiet. As a rule, and she's very, very. I'm the fiery one. She's the kind of da, da da da. But when she is like had it, I'm like okay. And I was like, mommy, mommy, get your purse. Let's go. Let's go. We got to get all these roses I'll let you back keep, to the I'll Home let Depot. You keep a. Yeah, but it seemed like you had about forty in there. I, had, well, I don't know, but it was the full garage. Her car couldn't get in here, and it was well, okay. We got to go. Let's get all the roses back. Welcome to the Zami Nobla National Organization of Black Lesbians on Aging podcast. We are your sound source for Black lesbian history. I'm your host, Angela Denise Davis. I get tickled fuchsia when I hear about couples who've been together over a number of years. So today, you know, I am very excited to bring our guest on the podcast, Lynette and Sabrina, who share the ups and downs of being in a relationship for the past 34 years. Sabrina and Lynette are members of our Georgia State Chapter of Zami Nobla, and we are excited to hear their story as they share about the joys of being older Black lesbians and being in a relationship that has stood the test of time. I'm Sabrina Francis White. I am 67. And I show up in the world with empowering people. Uh, I love coaching people. I love seeing them soar, making them realize their potential is exciting. Um, and I love giving back. Um, it's important to me to share um, and for people to recognize their importance and their value. Um, that's the biggest plus for me in life. You want to say anything else? No. Continue. My name is <laughs> Lynette White. I am 67. I will be 68 in February. I have uh, education in music originally. I worked for the post office for 26 years as a letter carrier and then as a lobby director. Retired, worked in uh, music a little bit in California, then uh Stopped that, went into life and health and property and casualty insurance, didn't care for that too much. And I'm currently, for the past five and a half years, a mortgage loan officer specializing in reverse mortgages for seniors. Um, it's very rewarding most of the time. Um, I also like making a difference and giving back. And although I did it with Medicare health insurance, I find this more rewarding because this is something people can benefit from while they're still yet with us. So until I retire, that's probably what I'll do and then eventually go back into music. Wonderful. Wonderful. I'm interested in the the music angle, uh, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that because, you know, music is my passion as well. I I'm just so excited that you both are here for the Zami Nobla podcast. You are also uh, members in our new Georgia State chapter which we just started uh, at the end of last year, the beginning of this year. It's so exciting to see just the wonderful gift and wealth of women who have shown up to be a part of this, our second official chapter for Zami Nobla. And um, we'll talk a little bit more about that as well. But why don't we also dive now into your telling us about where you grew up and some early childhood influences. Well, I guess I'll lead. Um, I grew up in Daytona Beach, Florida. I'm a Floridian by birth. Um, and I have two sisters, but I really was raised as an only child. So um, my world was the world. I enjoyed it, you know, living there, playing and, and being free to climb the trees, eat anything else I could touch. Um, and at one point, I my mom, first, my mom died and my first mother died. And I moved to um, 
living with my grandmother and my two sisters. And that was a different experience for me, coming and being raised initially by myself. Um, so I had to adjust to sharing, which was um, quite a journey. Um, that was not a comfortable home for me at that point. So I ended up with my biological mother in Chicago. And um, that became my confidant, my friend, everything. You know, we were each other's world. Um, so I was very comfortable with that. And I got to find out much later my, my mother was bisexual. And um, that was, I didn't find out. She kept that away from us till I was going into college. And I thought, oh, and I was deciding on who I was going to be. So I had a very open, I guess, entry into my life and the lifestyle of being a lesbian and understanding I had a great guide. Um, so I was lucky in that way. You know? What was your, your coming out uh, to your mother like? How did you, did you process her, that with her doing your early years, doing college, or what was that like? So I was graduating from high school and getting ready to go to college. And my mother used to have what we call a, a table conversation each every so often, every two weeks or so with the girls. And that conversation was, you threw out anything you wanted to discuss. So I was about two weeks from graduation and I had decided on college and she sat down and she said, oh, so let's talk about life and what it's going to look like there because I was going to live on campus. And I remember sitting there and I said, well, I have something to tell you. Um, I decided that, you know, I really like girls. And uh, she, she looked at me, she paused for a moment, and I thought, okay. And she said, wow, um, I knew this was coming, but I was really hoping you would, you would make a different decision. And I was shocked for a moment because she had always been very open, and, and I, we, we had transvestites, we, had, we went through different things together. It was a lot of interesting people that came in and out of our home, and I wasn't expecting that. And I kept thinking, oh, my God, I've disappointed my mother. And uh, so I said to her, I said, why? She says, this is a very hard life. She said, and you're going to be ostracized um, and people may attack you and it may start with family. And she said, and you're going to have to be self-supportive. And I said, OK, I'm OK with that. And she said, well, um, you know, you'll have to find someone that's going to be able to either take care of you or you take care of yourself. And I thought, well, no. I don't, I will take care of myself and it will be okay. And she said, you're such a romantic. She says, I knew from the little girl down the street that you walked to school every day for the last four years that this was going to be you. She said, you thought she was your best girlfriend, but she was your first crush. Um, and I said, yes. She said, so I understand the comfort of that. She says, but you know, you, you have to be secure and I thought, well, no. She says, you want to, you want the fairy tale ending. I said, well, yes, I do. Why can't I have the fairy tale ending? And I said, you know, I hear your concern, but I've looked at the women in my, you know, in my world, and from what I've seen, I choose to have that, and I'm not willing to believe it can't happen. Um, that's not my story. And she said, okay. She says, so you want the white picket fence with the house and the knight to ride up in shining armor? And I got really kind of mad, which with my mom, you know, the black mama, you didn't say anything, but I was really kind of perturbed and I kind of raised my voice and I thought, and I said, well, you know, why can't I? Yes, I want my nitrous in shining armor and I think you should ride up in a white steed and why can't I have that? Now the house I don't care about. And I heard her, she said, oh, and she, she would do her hand, calm down, calm down. She said, so what if you have to be the person on the white steed? I said, why can't we both have white steeds? Mm. <laughs> and so that is how it began. And she accepted that and she says, okay, let's see how this all plays out. You know, so it was a good start. A little scary coming back at it, but it was a good start. <laughs> was that at the same time when she uh, disclosed to you that she was bisexual? It was not. My sisters were aware that she was because they were raised by my grandmother. My grandmother knew. And that was a different story. So they, my grandmother didn't approve of my mother being bisexual. Oh. She felt she was gay. But my mother actually played both sides of the field. And um, so they knew that part. 
And my mother didn't tell me that until I came home for the first freshman year of college. And my sister said, they had a, we had an argument. She said, you just don't know your mother's really gay. And I thought, no, my mom would have told me because we were so close. I felt she would have told me that. And she didn't. And um, I drove home that summer, my first summer from college in Chicago to Florida. She'd moved to Florida. And I said, I was so angry. I was angry that she hadn't shared that because we I didn't understand why since she'd been honest about everything else. And I felt very hurt that she hadn't shared that part of her. And I remember driving into the yard and they said, well, she's living with a woman in Florida. And I, and I still just, I just couldn't. By the time I drove in, to from Chicago to uh, Florida, Daytona Beach, Florida. And I was like, so emotional. And when I got out the car and I saw her with this woman, all that pent up emotion just bubbled up. It just blew it. And I started just losing it with my mom. And um, she said, we'll go, let's go in, let's go talk in the house. And I was still just, why, why, why didn't you tell me? And I'm, I don't understand. And I was so, so hurt. Mm. And um, I heard her say to me, because I was out off the top and I heard her say, okay, take a deep breath, calm down, bring your voice down and let's talk about it. She said, I didn't tell you because that's something you needed to make a decision about. And it was important not to influence who you were going to be. Uh, and I said, okay, took me a while but I understood why she didn't. And I never, no one could ever say to me, my mother influenced me in that sense. Mm -hmm. I always had to respect that. Once I understood, I had to respect that. But it was very emotional um, to find it out that way for me. You know, so, but yeah. What, like, okay. um, what an amazing journey. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Lynette, what about yourself? Tell us about your childhood early influences and how you came to discover your uh, your sexual orientation. Oh, that's quite a can of worms. Okay, well, I had no clue most of my life, and certain people in my life were making inferences about it, but I would become very angry about that uh, from about age 14 or 15. My mom and everybody was involved in the Pentecostal church. So that was a total non-existent conversation. And um, there were a couple of women now I can see looking back in the church that probably hit on me or tried to influence me. And I totally blew it off and dismissed it because it wasn't in my consciousness. I was aware uh, in high school, well, actually in the college, that I used to have what I called crushes on women, but they were non-sexual. I admired gym teachers, camp counselors, and very strong personalities, but I wasn't aware of any sexual attraction to them. Uh, I grew up, I thought, as a straight woman uh, into my 20s, um, was a late bloomer sexually even with men. And uh, I was practically 30 years old before that came up. And when it came up, I was still like ready to fight you if you implied that I might be gay, bisexual or anything. I mean, those were fighting words. And I was, you know, saying that was not who I was. And long story short, I got involved in a, <clears throat> a situation where those feelings rose to the surface in a very unexpected way. And I uh, freaked out because I was the person that walked around with my Bible condemning people to hell that dared to be gay or looked gay or seemed gay. I was a gay basher. So when I found that out, to be within me, it was quite disturbing because I, how could everybody know but me? So anyway, long story short, um, when I became aware of it, you know, I got a little therapy to try to sort through all these feelings because I actually had been engaged twice to two different men. Thank God I never got married, never had mm -hmm. kids, and just stayed by myself for five years trying to figure out who am I, what I, what am I? And, you know, sought out different mediums to just get some balance in that, started dating. And the women that I picked were way worse than any of the men I picked. So I thought maybe my picker was broken. I didn't really know how to do any of this. 
Uh, but after a few years, I, I got clarity, and then I was seriously on the hunt for uh, a mate. And we'll get into how we met later, but um, it was a journey. I uh, got a lot of uh, blowback from the family um, because of our faith that how could I dare, you know. And once I was clear on who I was, then I held firm and I said, well, this is who I am. And uh, if you can't accept me and you can't accept who I'm with, then I will not be coming to certain family functions. And I made a stand very, very early um, once I knew. And over the time, my family finally, you know, came around. And now it's like, where's Sabrina if she's not with me? So it's come full circle. But it was a journey. And I had to work through a lot of emotional stuff with the religious conflicts. I know a lot of gay people struggle with that. But I really uh, was a religious studies major as well as a music major. So I kind of worked through a lot of that, you know. God doesn't make mistakes, and obviously I am who I am. So, you know, I found a path and a peace with that, but it was a long process. Today I'm very comfortable in my own skin. Where did you grow up? Uh, Los Angeles. Okay, California. Yeah, and California and, you know, Pasadena, Altadena area, the valley. I lived in L.A. my whole life until uh, my mate decided we should move to Georgia in 2017. Prior to that, I lived in L.A. the whole time. So this was a, a major a change, but a good change. So religion being such a, a big part of your life, I, I'm curious to know now what are, are some of those um religious landmarks that you still maintain? Are you, do you consider yourself a religious person? Are you still within the, the Pentecostal church or how, how have you processed that, that religious part of your side? Well, I had to obviously leave the church. Matter of fact, I got kicked out of a couple of churches because what was really interesting in my case, when I was in my twenties, I got uh, kicked out of two churches before I ever even knew I was gay, before I had ever done anything sexual with a woman of any, they suspected it, confronted me. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And they said, well, you can't do music in our church unless you get delivered. So there was a lot of scar and damage. I am just now in the last year or two, uh, reuniting with an established uh, church. We go to a unit, a Unitarian church. Um, but I, I had to withdraw completely. Uh, I sought out other um, avenues of support to find my path back to some kind of spiritual life. So I'm no longer a part of the Pentecostal church, haven't been for probably almost 35, 40 years, but I uh, consider myself a spiritual person and I do have a faith in myself and in God. And uh, But I had to expand my belief system because mine was very narrow. And my thought was, well, if God is not pleased with who I am, then I have no life. So I had to find some path that I was okay and that God loved me. But I don't know if I answered your question. Um, but basically, I had to do a lot of work. You did answer my question. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think it's so important and such a blessing now for uh, for those in our community to have religious and spiritual spaces where they can work out you know, one's uh, spiritual life in a loving and affirming community. Uh, we still have some spots and some places where, where that's uh, still negotiated and heavily so, but I love hearing people talk about their spiritual journey and knowing that uh, there is a journey and it, it can be something that one uh, returns to when they find a loving, supportive community. So thank you for sharing that. I think the joy that I feel now from our conversation is just being able to talk with both of you uh, in your late 60s and for us to hear stories of your uh, resilient stories of your joy, stories of celebrating who you are and how you move in the world and having our listeners share into that. Because I think there's so many stigmas around, first of all, aging 
stigmas around aging, stigmas around being a black woman, stigmas around being a lesbian. And so when you put all of those together, it could be, it could be quite, quite a, a, a story. A list. A yes. list. Yes, a list. <laughs> uh, so uh, as you look back on your, your life, if we talked about your, your earlier um, beginnings and where you are now, what's the joy you have now as, as older black lesbians? I think the joy is being comfortable in my own skin, being um, content in a, a very loving, supportive relationship. I really do believe we are each other's yang, yang, yang and yang. yang. Yes. Yes. Um, <laughs> what I suck at, she's great at and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So I always tease and say, together we make a perfect person. Absolutely. But yet we <laughs> like our own space. We like our own me time, but we love our we time. And um, I am just excited that I plan to retire in a year. She's already retired and I'm looking forward to having more we time, you know, and we actually like each other. We've seen a lot of pain and a lot of uh Interesting relationships where people don't talk to each other for days and don't sleep in the same room and don't, you know, just stuff that we would just never do. I mean, to be in a relationship this long, you have to be willing to be vulnerable. You have to be willing to not hide. You have to share your feelings. And we talk a lot and we just enjoy each other's company doing nothing. And, you know, I know so many people that um, don't have that. And I, Try to share when I can with other people that have been together for shorter times. This takes work. This is not you got a list, I got a list, and you have to meet everything on my list. It's about compromise. It's about what can you, I say, what can you live with? What can you settle with? Hmm. Because nobody's perfect. I have stuff, she has stuff, but I love all of her, you know? And I remember when we first started I mean, we'd have stupid arguments about which way to squeeze the toothpaste Mm -hmm. and which way to put the toilet paper on, you know, and the whole thing of control. And I'm right and you're right. This is my kitchen. This is my house. And after a while, none of that stuff is really important anymore. I'm done. (laughs) I forgot the question you tossed them. (laughs) What what is your your joy at at being being an older black lesbian? Um, for me, it's about once in a while, my mother's passed. Now I say to my mom, as I talk to God, you were wrong. There was a fairy tale ending and I was able to find a woman that could stand with me toe to toe, challenge me. Um, and I like the joy and the ease of knowing that there's someone that absolutely understands who I am. There are days I wish she didn't know me as well. But um, (laughs) that brings me a certain comfort in knowing that I was able to live life on my own terms. Um, As I look back and over my life and the things I've gone through um, to get here, I'm excited for where I am today. I didn't know I didn't know this vision was there. God truly had a bigger vision than I did. I, I thought, okay, I'd just like to be comfortable and find someone that we can go through life with. Um, and I don't think I really understood it, how big that could be and what it would bring. So um, when I look around me and I look back, the joy of that journey, even with the dark moments, I understand where they I've come from and the growth, you know, and the, the, the foundation that my mom gave me um, has served me well. You know, and I, I I have a joy where I can smile and look at her today and like, OK, um, and I can volunteer and, and see all the things that I've been able to do. And yet that will come. So uh, it's exciting to be 67 to be almost 68, though I'm still younger than her uh, by a few months. Um, you know, I didn't I didn't see all of this life and uh, it's been a good it's been a good journey. I have no regrets on this journey. You know, and and that's the part I enjoy. Take us back to the beginning. How did you all meet? Well, (laughs) um, that's an interesting story. I had relocated from Chicago to L.A. I did not know anyone. And I have always been big with going to groups and and getting involved. And I got involved with a, a women's group 
in one of the suburbs of, of LA. And I had gone to this group and these two ladies approached me, one of the meetings and says, oh, we have a friend we would love you to meet. And I thought, okay, this could be interesting. Uh, but they said, well, now we just want you to know, you know, she's a wonderful lady and she's really nice. And they had all this conversation. I thought, okay, what's the matter with her? She's wonderful. She's single. What's wrong? You guys are you know, you guys are pitching for what's going on. Um, but I thought, okay, I'll meet her. I have, you know, nothing to lose. I'm really open for her. So uh, we, they set us up on a blind date. Um, we had not spoken. And I ended up, I worked in retail. So I ended up driving and meeting her in, in, in West, West Hollywood, Hollywood for dinner. Which is the gay spot in California. Yeah, at that time, it was the biggest spot there. And it still is. But um I said, okay, I'll, I'll meet this person. This this should be, I love adventure. So this was an adventure for me. Uh, and I remember I thought, okay, God, um, when I left LA, I left Chicago, I was getting out of a relationship and I really wanted to make sure that this time around that I was out of the driver's seat and I would put God in control. And I said, okay, whoever shows up, I'm going to stay in the passenger seat. I'm going to trust. So, we met for dinner. I was late. She's very punctual, extremely punctual. And I was like, she, she like, I guess 30 minutes late or, or more. And she was like, oh, uh, uh, okay. But I was coming from a long distance and it was late and I was closing a store. I'm like, okay. I said, okay, this didn't get out to a good start. Cause she said, oh, you, she was like, you're not, I'm like, oh gosh, she's one of these people that's on time. Um, but we had a wonderful time. She had a thousand questions for me. And I decided after sitting, after meeting her, the best way is I just need to, I don't need to really talk. I just need to answer her questions. Because um, it was very clear that she had been through some things and I just needed to show up and listen. And and I remember sitting there as we closed the restaurant down and walked for another hour or two talking again and kept thinking, Lord, is this it? And I thought, well, I really didn't. I was trying to make sure I was not in the driver's seat. Um but she was fascinating. Um, it was fascinating for one because she was very authentic. She wasn't, there was no pretend. She didn't filter. She just, that part of her religion that told her, you take care of your brother and your sister and you say what you need to say, that was it. And I thought, Lord, where has she been? How has she survived in this world? And I kept thinking, this cannot be real. And I thought, oh my God, but it is. So I kept making for the next day because I thought, well, then this has got what could the next state this can't continue and I, I mean this is this is impossible that she survived this long just can't and I thought oh my god this is real this this is really who she is um and the fascination still continues because I would, I've gone through more rabbit holes and tried more things with her I'm like okay we're doing what now okay fine all right let's just go and try um, but she still surprises me in 34 years. And I'm like, now you want to do what? Okay. I got the logistics. This is what we're going to do. That's fine. I'm going to, let's go. You know, and um, so I still go on my adventures and I still have my surprises. Um, and, and I think that's been the joy for me. Um, you know, I'm a Gemini. So I just, you know, I love, I love things thrown up in the air. And uh, I never know with my wife. I don't know what's coming out what she's going to say, and I don't know what she's going to do. Um, so I, I'm i just like, okay, here we go. You know, and so that that was our, that was our evening. You know, we, we, <laughs> it's, it's, it's been, a, it was fascinating. You know, the second date wasn't any less fascinating. I was a little bit mm -hmm. too honest <laughs> and too direct. <laughs> so, so what's your impress, impression of that first meeting, Lynette? I had been, a little, you know, I, like I said, my picker was broken in the beginning, so I'd meet some very strange type people. And uh, I was thinking, I know I'm a nice person. I know I have a lot to offer. So what's wrong with me? <laughs> and um, basically what I learned from her was, you know, I scared people because I was so like, this is me. What you see is what you get. And it really was. You know how when people first date, they try to put their best foot forward and they maybe hold back on things that they think, yeah, if you knew this much. about me, you probably run. Well, I was just out there. I figured, you know what? I'm 30 something years old. I'm looking for, you know, a real relationship. This is me. 
And she didn't wasn't sure if this was really me, but she discovered <laughs> soon that, yeah, I just said exactly how it was, um, which could put some people off because they're not used to somebody in their face like that. But mm-hmm. it fascinated her, which then fascinated me. So I just asked her everything I wanted to know right away because I wanted to uh, weed her out. If she was a danger, she could go away tomorrow, <laughs> you know, and um I I I sensed that she was a genuine person. I knew she had had, you know, a relationship that wasn't as good as she would have liked either. But I knew in my spirit that we both wanted the same thing. We wanted something real, something that would last. So um, I knew very early on that that she was the one. Don't ask me how I knew, but I knew in my soul that this was my soulmate. So after barely dating a month, I said, I think you're the one for me. And she says, how do you know that? <laughs> and I was like, I, 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 I know, you know, and she said, well, you know, my love grows over time. So needless to say, um, I, I took a leap of faith. I had never lived with anyone before romantically. I had had roommates in college, male and female, non-sexual roommates, literally roommates and now this woman and her two cats were gonna like move into my house and I was terrified you know she pulled every friend she knew I had to get opinions I had a list of five yes. people I said this woman wants to move in my house what do you think <laughs> you know <laughs> because you know I was like if I'm gonna do something I'm gonna do something mm-hmm. so I just uh jumped in and I was content at dating her for a whole year from a distance, because she lived uh, a good 30, 40 minutes from me. That was fine for me, and we could visit every weekend. That didn't work for her. She said, we're going to do this. I don't like this long distance thing. I have to move in. And I was like, you have to move in. <laughs> <laughs> so it was it was quite... Well, you knew. You said, I know. And I said, give me, okay, I need a moment. Give me a moment so I'll feel comfortable, because she had gone through some things. It was very clear. Mm-hmm. So for mm-hmm. me, it's very... It's very important to handle people with, especially their emotions. You have to be aware and handle, that's precious. Emotions are precious. And I wanted to make sure that I did no more damage. Okay. It was, you know, and I I felt like, okay, um, I'm glad you know. But since I asked, I was trying to stay out the driver's seat and I had asked God to know. And I kept, so when I said, no, wait for, she had to go for a week. I said, I need you to wait for a weekend. And, um, and let me let me really pray on it, and, and I need a moment. And I said, "Well, okay." When she got back, I said, "All right, I'm I'm feeling that this is going to be fine." Um, but then I'm once I decide, then I'm all in. I'm done. But if you want this, and we need to know how it's work, I've had enough relationships. Let's find out right now because I throw my cards in. But let's let's move ahead. Um, and and she was terrified. I didn't know one of her things that she polled everybody in the world. You know, so about everything, anything that had to be discussed when you first initially had to have that conversation. You do not poll the world. You start here first, and we can talk about it. But stop polling all these people, <laughs> and then come back with all this information that they may have no idea about. And I'm like, okay. So we we once we understood the ground rule of the polling and how we can communicate was fine. So you know, she's like, okay, okay. And I thought, well, let's just see how it's going to work. And, you know, so we, we went from there, you know, and then it's been interesting, <laughs> you know, but for me, I knew, she said, I know, I really know that you're the one. And I thought, all right, but I had done things on my own most of my life. I had always had to be, I call very broad shoulders and I had been always carried everything I needed to do. I'm one of those that there's a plan for the plan for the plan because crap happens, so I always need some place to land. And uh, we had been dating. We had been dating maybe six months. Five months. And I had moved in at that point, I guess. And I had this car that I was driving all over work. And I worked at that point for, I was a district manager. So I worked and drove a lot. And my car had died, literally died. I had fixed it, had repaired it. And I took it to a mechanic. And he said, I'm telling you now the car is dead. Don't put any more money in it. So when that happened, she came home. I was sitting on the couch on her couch, and I thought, 
I was sitting there trying to think, okay, Father, I've done this, this, and this. I don't know what else to do. The car is dead. What am I going to do? And I was just trying to work all my ABC. Nothing, none of my things worked. I was like, oh, my goodness. And uh, I, she came in, and she came in from work, and she looked at me. She said, what's wrong with me? And I shared with her about the car. And uh, she said, mm. So she went I, She went in and took her shower because she was working at the post office. And, um, and I'm still sitting there trying to figure this out. I'm thinking, oh, my God, you know. Mm. Uh, I hear her come back out, and this woman says, she said, well, let's go. I says, go where? I says, I got the, the car. I'm trying to figure out. I got to be on the road tomorrow. I don't know. What, what. She says, we, you need a car. Let's go get a car. We need to get a car. And uh, I sat there for a moment, and I said, excuse me? She says, well, you need a car. And I said, I can't, I, mean, I, don't, I can't get a car right now. I mean, I'm trying to think of all the logistics and she said, no, we need to get a car. Let's go. And as I'm still sitting in the car with her to go get this car, my mind is like, oh, my God, this can't be happening. And I had always prayed. You know, my mom, I said to her, my mom, I said, I just want someone that can meet me 50-50. I don't want 60-40. I want 50-50. I want to know that I can take a breath. And if I can't meet, if I can't get this, you got that. And at that moment, I said, okay, Father, I I know, beyond a doubt, this was your parry. Um, I don't have to do this by myself. Um, and that was a moment for me that I could let go. And I'm like, okay, you know, um, it's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And it was nice, frightening, mm -hmm. unsettling to let go of that control. But I said, all right, this is the right person. We can do this dance. You know, and that that was a that was a great feeling. And we've been doing the dance ever since, you know. Um, though we do have to learn how to who had what who had the steering wheel at what time, because sometimes we wanna both have the steering wheel. And that did not always work out because we're both very strong women. Um so we had to learn how to back up and I had to learn to give her room, you know, um, and the house was the other part. I was like, oh, my God, you know, so her house was very nice and very thin, but it had no personality. And I'm I love personality. And so when we got our first home, that was the first time that we had to, <laughs> had to come to terms. You are sharing the house and you cannot make all the decisions about the house, Sabrina. Um it needs to be a shared conversation about the house. Um, so we had to kind of start that part of who, how you handle those conversations and um, to make room for both of you to be not only just comfortable in the house, it, the house was symbolic of the other relationship. I had to make room across the board. No, so it's, it's been interesting. It's still interesting. <laughs> that, that's an incredible story because as I'm listening to it, I'm saying, wow, Lynette, that's a, a huge thing to buy a car from somebody for somebody that's like major. Mm -hmm. And you were so uh, fresh into the relationship. What were you thinking when you're in the shower, you know, <laughs> and getting ready to come out and tell this new love of yours, well, let's go get a car? Part of me was terrified and part of me was like, well, she's here. She lives with me now. She's made this commitment. I know she's a hardworking person. And I know right now, you know, she doesn't have the budget to buy a new car right now because, you know, she had relocated and everything. And I said, you need to put your money where your mouth is. If you feel that she's the one, you're going to have to trust that what you know in your inner being is correct. And at the time, um, you know, I had good credit and everything, and I knew I could go buy a car. I wasn't trying to buy one for me. I already had one, but I felt like if this is really who I'm supposed to be with, we need to get this handled. So I didn't realize she was as shocked as she was until we got there, and then she got really, really quiet, and then, you know, I had to do all the negotiating with the dealership and everything, and what she didn't say, this is the funny part, was, um, she, if you don't mind my sharing, yeah. she had never had a new car before, okay, yeah. so she went with a, a used car that was cute, and it had all the bells and whistles, but it was a used car, mm -hmm. and but she liked it, so first I said, okay, so we got it. 
And we took, we brought it home. And then when I looked, I said, this car has got 45,000 miles on it. Uh 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 uh. So I just slept on it. And I woke up in the middle of the night. And the next morning, I said, this car is going back. And she said, what? I was like, oh, no. I said, no, no, no. (laughs) No, we can do better than this. So she was terrified again, went back to the car dealership. And I said, I don't want this car. And they said, what? I said, I don't want this car. Uh, We need to get another car. And I said, no, I'm going to buy something, but not this car. So we ended up getting her a new car, but it was more stripped down. It didn't have all the bells and lights, but it was a new car. But it was a stick. And she had never driven a stick before. I had. Okay. I had at the time, uh, what I have? Toyota Camry, I believe. I think I had a Camry. I had an automatic Camry. And I said, no problem. I'll teach you how to drive this car. And in the interim, you can take my car to uh, travel because I live, I worked four miles from where we lived and she had a drive like a 30, 40 minute drive. I said, well, you can use my car to go to work and then I'll teach you how to drive the car on the weekends. So anyway, that became a whole level again of trust. But I was so mad because my little kid was like, oh, I have a new car. But then I'm driving her car, watching her drive my new car down the street. And I'm like, <laughs> Oh, you bought this. You know, you didn't buy me a new car. You bought yourself a new car. And now my car is going down the street. How long did it take you to learn how to drive it, Sabrina? Oh, Lord. Um, mm. About three three to four months before it she was did. really comfortable. I was scared to drive it, first of all. I didn't want, I, 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 for, I think she said, drive your car. And for the first week or two weeks, I told her, no. No, I'm not going to drive the car because I was terrified to drive the car. I hadn't drove in a stick. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So I refused. I just drove her car, but then I was mad because I would see her in that car. That's my car, but I can't. So I said, okay, I'm going to learn to drive the car. She took me out. We did driving lessons. And I was like, okay, I'm finally going to try to drive the car. Well, I still was nervous. So I got up one morning to go to work, and I told her that morning, I said, oh, the night before, I said, okay, I'm ready to drive the car to work. But then I got up and I was like, oh, no, I don't think I want to try it this morning again. I'm just going to drive her car. But I had told she worked early. I, so I looked up and I realized she wasn't at the house. I said, oh, I start and we, every morning I, we have a thing in the house. No matter where she's at, if she's usually up, with the, I start calling Lenny. Good morning. Good morning. You know, and I didn't hear any response back. I said, oh, gosh, she's she's gone. With, and so, with my car. And I so I run to where her car is where the car is parked and her car is gone. And I run several times back to the window and I look at this car. And I don't know why I thought the car was gonna reappear on the second time. It really was <laughs> the same car, but I was hoping it was and I thought, oh God, oh, I have to drive this car this morning. And so well, she was supposed to be uh, off and she got called to uh, work. And I was already gone. Oh my gosh. And I managed to, I, I was good, except the cuss, I'm sure anybody did for the last first month, anybody behind me on the hills in LA cursed me out. Oh. I learned to flip the mirror up because I couldn't, I couldn't shift and I would stall out. So I'd miss, it would take me two to three lights, if not four to get through up to the hill. So I was like, I just learned to turn the, ignore the horns and just turn them. I'm, I'm, get, I'm really going to get to this time. I'm getting through the light. Oh, it was a monster. Oh. But the moral of the story was I was determined that she was going to learn how to drive that car. And eventually she learned how to drive that car. And then she became an animal and <laughs> loved it. And she liked the aggression of shifting those gears. Yeah. And once she got over the hill thing and not rolling back like she was going to hit somebody behind her, then it was her car. And now I couldn't drive it anymore because mm. it was her car. Mm. So she went full circle on me. And uh, it was very, very funny because I knew something about her personality that she would like driving a stick. And she got to a point where she liked driving a stick even more than I did. And wow. then it was her car and it was mine. Her car was boring then. <laughs> it's like, I can't ship anything. I know. Well, speaking of heels and challenges, what would you identify as uh, some significant challenges that you all as a couple have had to overcome? Um, we had to overcome setting boundaries with my family. My family, most of my family lives in Los Angeles still. And I have... Um, I had senior parents, and they um, lived with us 
a couple different times. What, two or three different times? Three. Let's, let's see. One, two, three. One, three. The first house. Yeah. No, two. Twice. Well, oh. my stepfather lived with me before we got together. Yeah. Anyway, um, my mother, her, and my stepfather, he's deceased now, but all three of them are Gemini. So I felt like I lived with six people, literally. And, you know, I'd wake up in the morning to go, which one are you? Because <laughs> I didn't know what I was going to contend with. But my mother and, and she have a wonderful relationship. My mother's still alive. But, uh, you know, they both, it was both their homes or it was her daughter's home. And she said, no, this is my home. So I had to learn how to find peace between my mother and my, my wife, which can be quite challenging when you all live in the same home. So that was a challenge for us. We had them live with us for X amount of years. And then we decided that that wasn't the best thing. So it was very hard to tell my parents they had to move. But we kind of told them we were going to sell the home and move back closer to L.A. because we had very long commutes. And then another time we had to have them live with us again in our next home. Mm -hmm. And without going into all the details, I have a wayward brother who would create havoc. And so my mom, the rescuer, and they're, they're all born again. So, you know, my brother would call us lesbian demons and he was disrespectful to us. And my mother would bring him into our home and she kept disrespecting. So the hardest challenge we had was to lovingly move them out again and set boundaries for us because nobody wants to put their mother out. Not in literally put her out on the street, but we had to work and stand united as a couple to set boundaries so that we could have our quality of relationship, but still be there and care for family. And family, if you let them, can run all over you and ruin not only your relationship, but your sanity. And thank God today, we have been able to still have positive relationships with all my born again family that have grown to love Sabrina as my wife and actually call her my wife now, where, you know, 25 years ago, um, that wasn't the case. So we learned how to set boundaries that were a saving grace for us. That was, I think, the hardest thing. And then when we moved to Georgia, we did offer them to come with us. Thank God they didn't choose to come. But if they wanted to come, we would have gone through that yet a third time. But each time we got better and stronger as a couple. Because you have to do that. You know, you have to do that with family anyway. But when family's in your house, that's a whole nother story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the thing when we for us is that because we communicate so much and we're so open with each other, um, we could comfortably have conversations uh, about her family and the dynamics. I think it's very hard when my family was always away, so it wasn't an issue. I think it's very hard when you have family and the other half is not willing to look honestly how that family functions. That's never been her problem. Uh, that's that part of her that is, this is where it is, this is real. Um, but I always respected family because I did not have a lot, didn't come up with a whole lot of family. And so my agreement was uh, mothers are special to me. So you give them, and I love her mom, even to this day. Um, I love I love mom dearly, and I treat her like I treated my mother. You know, I cater to her, and, and she'll tell me, okay, the two of you together is really that's not a good thing because you spoil her. I'm like, yes, but I don't have my mother to spoil anymore. Um, you know, we had to go through the first time. I had never lived with parents except my mother. And um, she's a typical Gemini like I am. So, yes, mine is mine and this is mine. And we, we did have to have some come to Jesus talks um, with respectfully, but we did, you know. And um, now we, we have the same talks, but I call her mom. She's mommy. Mommy, how you doing? What's going on? Um, and I enjoy taking her places and dressing her and, and buying and doing for her as if she was my mother. Um, but yeah, we do have clear boundaries and you have to be willing to be able to communicate that. That's, that's that part of that glue is you have to have that united front, um, on, on what happens. You know, that was one thing that we worked through and I, you have to back up sometimes that's not your family. 
So you have to respect that she has to have the, we can have our conversation, but she has to have the conversation with that part of the family. And I need to respectfully be Switzerland. Okay. I am there if you need me, but I need to respect that you're going to have that. And I am Switzerland, you know, and, and that's kind of how I've always looked at that piece. Um, but I'm that support, whatever you need. I am that support. But I, I try to be very fair with that, you know, and that was that was one thing to go through um, from the family side. For me, in, in there, I came from spending and enjoying life and, and, and making money and doing what I wanted to do. And suddenly I had this person that financially I had to be financially accountable to, you know, and I had to learn to do. They did things differently and their expectations and how they looked at money was different. So I was kind of like, hmm, I worked hard. And that went no back roses. to my, oh, <laughs> no roses. yes, I, I yes, I, we bought the first house we bought and um, we had this wonderful landscaping and I just love the landscape. And mom and I got together and we went to Home Depot and they had a wonderful rose sale. And I had bought, I roses were already in the yard and I came back and we had bought Oh my God, so many roses. So my wife pulled in from work. We had a hour long drive from work. She went to put her car in the garage. Hour and a half. <laughs> and there was nowhere for the car to go because it was full of roses. Um, but it was a great deal. And I and so <laughs> so uh, my so mom and I, we had, had a ball shopping and so we were in the kitchen and, and she storms in and she said, Where well, is going on in the garage? So I was beginning to explain to her, this is a great sale. She said, you know what? I don't care. Those roses, you have enough roses, they go back. And I was still trying to explain it. She was like, and she doesn't, she's, my wife is very quiet. as a rule and she's very, very, I'm the fiery one. She's the kind of da, 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 da. But when she is like, had it, I'm like, okay. And I was like, mommy, mommy, get your purse. Let's go. Let's go. We got to get all these roses back keep, to the I'll Home let Depot. You keep eight. Yeah, but it seemed like you had about forty in there. I had, well, I don't know, but it was the full garage. Her car couldn't get in here, and it was. I said, okay, we got to go. Let's get all the roses back. Uh, so <laughs> I've had to learn that you know uh, to really look at it money through her lens and understand that, and to be a lot more accountable and honest about that. You know, because those money can be a divider in any relationship. Um, and I was, and I had to let go because it was my money. My little kid was like, I work, this is my money. And okay, I want to give you that much of my money, but I'm going to keep the rest of my money because it's my money. Um, I, and so I really had to work on, it's not my money. It's our money. And she's not going to, she said, I'm not going to deny you something if we can get it. She says, but we, we got to know where we're going. And I heard it intellectually. But emotionally, because of where I came from and how I looked at money, I was like, yeah, but I need to have some money because I don't know about that. And um, so I had to really release that and allow that. And and you know what? She was right. I mean, there's nothing that if she if I'm, if that's something I asked for, it's there. And I've never had that denied. But I will tell you, that was that was a, a tough one for me. And that's where I talk about sometimes, you know, we bring our emotional stuff to a relationship and you got to be willing to open that suitcase and unpack that crap. And you're like, okay, well, you know, I think I'll pack this. No, no, you pack more over the men there. You got to get them all out. Okay. And that, so it was really, again, back to honesty. You know, I accepted the fact that I had to really hear how she felt. I had to respect how she felt. And I also had to be in touch with, that was my little kid thinking, well, I need to hold some. I don't know. You might you might decide you won't give me all my marbles. So I better hold some marbles just in case. And my mother's message of watching her, how she dealt with money and how she dealt with making sure she had security, that this was not her story, that this is what was going on. Um, and that was a, that was a part of me growing and letting go. Mm -hmm. and, and just to give you a marker, the first 10 years it was yours, mine, and ours. <laughs> and with heavy emphasis on the mine on this side. And I'm like, okay, 
y- your money's here. So I need this, this and that, you know, it's like roommates, you pay your half of this and that. Mm-hmm. And then after 10 years, um, she finally understood that we would do better if we commingled everything since we weren't leaving each other, you know, <laughs> one checking account, a credit card with both our names on it, not the yours. Cause then you can't keep up with who's spending what and, Anyway, it took 10 years just for you people that still, this is my account, that's your account. What, what, how much do I owe you? After the first 10 years, then it became a we thing. And since we did that, 34 years later, three houses later, we're in a better spot than we ever were, than we were doing the yours, mine, and ours. And she no longer is afraid that I'm going to keep anything or take anything. I let her know what I'm doing. But now she actually listens to me as I have to listen to her because there's a lot of things I don't do as well as she does. And so I've had to learn and grow from her. And she has learned and trusted in my I happen to be, you know, good in financial things. So that's why we do well as a we, mm-hmm. not as a yours and mine. Yeah. And what, now I don't have any money. And, you know, used to, I had to have money in my and I said to her, oh, wait. I don't have any money. I have a credit card. I don't I need some cash? You know, and it used to be a time I had my cash. And I'm like, it's okay if I don't have any. I'll go to I'll go to the bank. Okay, give me, give me, give me money. I need to have some money. It's not important that I have the money don't anymore. The um, that's that's not important for me to do. You know, because I know the money's there. Whatever I want, if it's you know, we're gonna get what I need, and that's okay. This is a perfect segue to talk about the weeness of you as a couple. And by that, I mean your decision to get married, your married life, and just what it means to be a, a married lesbian couple. And and this question comes out uh, from the conversation we had on New Year's Eve when, when you all were at our home and you were talking about marriage. And I was just like, oh, God, this is such, such rich, rich um, sharing about the importance of uh, certainly you two as black lesbians who are married, because so many people have different opinions about marriage, same sex marriage. Well, you know, we're just following patriarchy or it's just a, a paper. What's the significance of the weenus of you all as a married couple? Um, for me, the, my, and I, we had to have some discussion on marriage when we started because she wasn't sure about marriage and needing to be married. Um, I don't need to be married. When I first spoke to her and once we decided that, okay, this is what we're going to do. And I said, okay, that was my marriage commitment at that point, in all due honesty. Um, because for me, it's never been about the paper. The paper gives me legality. Okay, it protects us and our assets. It makes sure that she's going to be taken care of, be it that medical or anything else, um, and that family and no one can come in and do anything else, take care, take anything away. Um, so it wasn't about that, but it was about standing in front of when you have family that okay, we don't know if this is the right thing you're doing religiously or whatever their thing is. Okay, and society says, well, we're not sure about this. I knew I loved her, and I knew she was the most important thing to me. To be as something different, to stand up in front of your friends and family um, and commit that love and to honor that love, huh, I can't tell you that feeling. Okay, um, That's what it was about for me when I look at marriage. It, it's you know, whether you ever get a piece of paper, you have to make the commitment first. And so the paper should just be, oh, it's a technical thing that you do for a legal thing. I don't look at it as a patriarchy. I don't look at it as anything else but that. Because the love is, the commitment is made beyond any of that. You know, that's when I, that's that's what matters to me the most, is that this, my word to her and my commitment, knowing what she's gone through, was what mattered. The promise was that you will never have to go through what you went through before. I will be here. No matter what, however it looks, we will throw our stuff in the middle of the table, how ugly ever it gets. And I'm I'm the fiery one. So yes, there have been some moments I'm just like, you know what, I just don't, I'm just I just need to go in the other room for a moment. 
But that's okay. We're going to come back and figure it out. That's the commitment. Even in the tough times that happen in the relationship where you, you know, you get those times where I don't know if I want to do this. Uh, something looks green on the other, past looks green on the other side. All of those moments, you come back and understand the value of what you've got. Now, see, all that other stuff, huh, that's a nice ego stroke, but that's exactly all it is. It's an ego stroke. So you cannot get that twisted because I there's nothing else more valuable than her love. I don't have to guess that she loves me. I don't have to guess that I'm cherished. I don't have to guess that I'm supported. I know that. You know, and, and that's what matters. So it's easy to make that commitment, you know, because where am I going? I'm just going to fuss and go to the other room and then come back and say, well, what are you doing? It's, <laughs> it's definitely cheaper to keep her. Yeah, <laughs> now, for me, um, once I got past the religiosity part of marriage, you know, two women can't be married, two men can't be married. Um, I didn't totally believe that, but that was my indoctrination. Once I realized what we had and that neither one of us planned to go anywhere, I felt like, why not? We should be able to. We have the right to have the same rights, needs, acknowledgement, recognition as anybody else in the world. It wasn't so much about following the patriarchal system as much as I get to have the same thing. My love, my relationship is no less than any straight person's. And when I really felt that in my soul, of course I want to be married. Of course I want to say I do. Of course I want to wear a ring. Mm -hmm. Of course I have a right to have my marriage be as valid and as equal mm -hmm. as anyone else. Then my whole mindset shifted. Of course I want us on the same medical plan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it was like, why not? And how dare anyone say I can't? So I took a completely different shift. And it's like, now I'm proud to say I'm married. Now, technically, yes, because of the laws, we haven't been legally married for 34 years, but in our hearts, we have. Mm -hmm. We got married in 2014 when Obama made it official. We didn't do the first little run when people ran up to San Francisco and then they tried to annul them. I said, let's just wait until it's official because I'm already married to you as far as I'm concerned. But when it's the legal law, we're doing it. And we did. And it was just the icing on the cake because the cake had already been baked. Mm. Nice. Okay. Nice. So that's, that's, that's my position on it. So, yeah, I feel as married as anyone else. So what brought you all to Georgia? I'm, I'm curious. Of all the places you could have chosen, I mean, leaving California, uh, and you're coming to Georgia. Why Georgia? That was a hard decision for me. <laughs> it, it was finances. Um, I looked at, you know, I looked up, up the road. We were getting ready to retire. We were getting older. And we loved L.A. But I could never stop working. She could never stop working in L.A. And... Um, I had a niece that had a grandniece. Her, her and her wife had had a grandbaby there. And um, so I was very excited to have my grandniece there with me and the kids. Well, the, they moved back to Atlanta because it was too expensive for them to raise the baby there. So then I really thought, oh, okay, the baby is gone. Mm, this is, I'm not happy with the baby's gone. Um and then I thought, well, we do need, we have to relocate somewhere. And I had looked all over the world. I thought, well, okay, we'll see. I was never going to come back to the South because I was a Southern girl. So all the history of growing up in the South, I'm like, yeah, no. And I didn't want to live in Florida for sure, yeah. which is where she was born. And I thought, okay. So I started watching uh, probably about 10 years. It took me 10 years to get her to, to move because she's born, raised, home is Cali California. And I thought, okay. We've got to find some place that we can retire. Um, we can change jobs if we want to, but we can live a comfortable life. And that will not be LA. And I do have a few relatives here. I have an aunt that lives yeah. here and an uncle and some cousins, but they've lived in Georgia as long as we've been together. So, you know, yeah. there was some family, not enough to make me want to run here, yeah. but enough to say, well, we both have some family here. Maybe I'll consider. Keep that was a hard sell. 
moving bazaar itself. So, and I realized that I was asking her to leave her family. Her mom, you know, was getting up in age. Um, her stepdad, all of the things that meant a lot to her. Mm -hmm. um, I had moved all over. I didn't have family was not even an issue for me to move. So the agreement was once we decided that she decided, okay, I'm going to do this. I said, okay, here's the deal. If we move all the way across country and you hate it, I will pack all that crap up. If I got to sell it to the last one, and we'll, I'll move you back to Cali. And that was that when I meant that. And I said, and if we get there, we will always keep money to make sure if you got to fly, you get home sick, whatever you need to do, you, you go to, you go home. If I can't go, you go home. Um, so she could be comfortable because I understood what it meant to have missing my mom, not having family since I really didn't have as much. Um, so that was our agreement. You know, we, when we got here and, and we came out, I guess two or three times before to try to figure out why Atlanta. And I did all the research, you know, cause she was kind of like, I don't understand why we can't just stay here in California, <laughs> you know? And I'm like, you want, I don't, I love you, but I do not want to sit and just look at you with a rocking chair and can't go anywhere. Uh, I want to be able to, to go and travel. And she's like, okay, whatever. So um, we got here and I thought, I don't know. Atlanta was, was constantly growing. It was becoming more diverse. It was becoming more progressive when I did all the research. So it seemed as close, as far south as I was willing to go, you know, and it's been a good move for us. It's been a different move, and it's been, but it's been a good move for us um, at this point. And we're just now beginning to figure out what community looks like for us in Atlanta. And because for a while we were like, well, maybe we'll move to Savannah, you know. And I'm like, okay, Sabrina, this is the warming part of you. Stay where you are. Okay. Um, I have moved with her since we've been together more than I moved in my entire life. <laughs> That's all I want to say on that. But it, but it has been a good move. Um, I, I am happy here. The only part that's hard for me still is since we are up in years, um, I've had to fly home four times or five times in the almost seven years we've been out here for funerals in California. So if someone's hurting or sick or passing, um, you know, to have to fly sometimes on a dime can be costly and I it's hard because I can't get to them quickly. That's the hardest part for me still. Um, I've flown home, yeah, almost every year mm -hmm. since we've been out here, Twice either me. for a major surgery or a funeral. Yeah, we just, we went to California together for the first time this past October, 2023, for a technical vacation, both of us. She's never been back with me since we uh, moved out here. And so that was actually nice because we got to spend time with the family. But every other time I went home, it was somebody had died. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's hard. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, this is this is a great place to live for us. Mm -hmm. Well, we are glad you're here and that you're part of the Zami Noble community. It has just been a real gift for us. So uh, this is a joy that we celebrate. I have a couple more questions before we close, because I feel like we could talk for hours. I'm so enjoying our conversation. I, I want to roll back, though, and Lynette, uh, talk to you about the gift of music in your life. And you talked about uh, this reintroduction and looking forward to doing some more music after you retire. Speak a little bit about that. Okay, well, I'll be brief. Originally, I was a music major in college and then went to music slash religious studies. Started originally in classical piano. Do not ask me to do that now. <laughs> I still own my, my piano. Uh, I actually have a grand piano in our home, which that's a whole other story she can talk about as far as moving it every time. We made all these moves. She had me move. Um, and then I got into singing uh, right before I met her. And then I started where I so I started. Uh, I found that I liked singing um, and I performed in California quite a bit uh, more jazz, R&B, you know, standard stuff like that. And less piano, but I do have that background so I could, you know, come up with my own arrangements. I knew enough piano skills to be able to figure out, you know, how I wanted to change up music and all of that. Um, and I perform three, four times a year, but it got to be hard because, um, you know, I was doing all the work and promotion myself and she was helping. So um, but I that's my real passion. Um 
But then, you know, because we wanted to move, you know, work became more of a priority. So you know how your art sometimes suffer when you're working. So since we've been here, I hadn't done anything. I just completely stopped music and it's re- I've really been missing it. So recently, um, since we got involved in this church, uh, I sung for the first time in eight years in October. We had a um, a LGBTQ plus event at the church and I sung at that. And I said, that's what's missing in my life. So she said, well, sister, you better get to it. So now the pastor just approached me uh, to sing something for Easter. Um, so I'm realizing that that is very important to my spirit, my soul. So I do want to become involved in that, you know. So she's saying, you know, go out and start doing open mics again, do this, do that. Of course, I work so much with this job now, I haven't made time for that, but that is on my list. And when it's not, she puts it in my face anyway. So it's nice to have a mate, though, that kicks you in your pants and reminds you of who you were and who you are when you get sidetracked. And unbeknownst to me, she says, I miss hearing you sing in the house. I said, I thought you'd be relieved <laughs> that I'm not. You know, you know, when she gets into me and them la la la's and again and again, I'm like, okay, that's that same song. All right. <laughs> we're still practicing. I, I I wanted to include that because, you know, Zami Noble has a community music education program and we use the ukulele as a vehicle for that. And uh, by the way, ukuleles are much easier to pack and transport than a grand piano. Just saying. Um, yeah. But but yeah. folks have just discovered that via the gift of music, particularly as an adult, when you're reentering uh, music uh, after an extended stay, it is just a real gift. So I just wanted to celebrate that with you and your entry into doing this with your church. I think it's phenomenal. And perhaps one day we'll be able to hear you sing at a Zami Nobla event. Wouldn't that be lovely? That would be awesome. Yeah, oh, I got to come so. off from hiding. Yeah, we'll, <laughs> we'll massage that. We'll massage that. The, the last question I ask uh, folks mm-hmm. is, is there something I didn't ask a question that you really think I should ask or something our, our listeners should know about the the two of you as we bring this interview to a close. Okay. I think from my perspective, that's not asked and maybe they hopefully seen um, people get a lot of things when we're talking about relationships and that alluded to the list that you come to, to relationships with and maybe we've all got them. And I would just like to say to people, whatever you think that list is, it's really important to write that down and look at it and really look at, particularly as little lesbians, as we're getting new relationships. Um, we come ready-made. It's baked, as my wife said. The cake is baked. You come with your own belief system, your own way of doing stuff, particularly as we get older. And you have to be willing to hear and adjust and be willing to try something new. You know, just as we age doesn't mean that you don't try nothing new. I have a big thing. I always say, baby, we're going on an adventure. If we go someplace new, it's an adventure. The move across was an adventure. You know, we did the church. I said, well, we don't know. It's, the church looks and sound different than what we used to, but it's a new adventure. Here we go. And I say that to myself because life must always continue to be an adventure. You know, I think aging is not about sedentary thought process. Um, You have to still face your fears, you know, and do different things, try different things. Um, And if they don't work, who cares? At this point, really, who cares? But it's be willing to explore, Um, explore the relationship. You know, it, it doesn't matter. Things change. Who we were at 30s are not who we are today. And 34 years, we change every year. We adjust. And there's still tricks that I'm like, what? where did you come up with this from? Um, and that, to me, is the joy. If you can keep that joy, you can keep that adventure, that willingness to keep looking at something different, I think makes a big difference in the relationship. That's the richness. That's the richness and the value in, in each other and how we share that. So that's that's all I would, would say. To yeah, good. Mm-hmm. And what I would say, especially you had a question there about um, older lesbians looking for a relationship. Um, I always am reminded 
that you take you with you. Mm-hmm. So the person that was in L.A. that drove all the way across country, me in a tr- truck pulling a 15-foot trailer by myself, never pulled anything in my life, and she driving my Honda CRV with two cats with hair flying everywhere, trying to get all the way across the country. Um, we were on an adventure, but when we got here, who we were was still with us. And um, I'm reminded that, yes, you have your list, but you also have to look at what you're bringing to the table, good, bad, and indifferent, and understand that none of us can have it all. And all of us have stuff wrong with us. And you can't focus too much on what you want. It's like, what can I bring to this new relationship that I want? How am I willing to compromise? And how am I willing to learn and grow? Because if you come in expecting this person to be like your list, you will be alone forever because nobody is going to meet everything on your list as you will definitely not meet everything on their list. And we're very quick to say she won't do it the way I think she should do it. My way is better. My habits are right. Who said? (laughs) So the thing that has made us work is I'm willing to lay all my stuff on the table and painfully face, okay, I know I've been doing it that way all these years, but maybe I'm not right. We're so afraid to be wrong. We're so afraid that if we compromise, that we'll give up our power and we won't know who we are anywhere anymore. And that's the challenge is to step in and see what happens. Then she chooses to say, we're on an adventure and we are, but if you're not willing to expand you will be alone forever. I have, a, and I'll leave it at this. I have a friend, my childhood friend, we're the same age. Um, she always had a list. She will be 68 in April. She has never gotten married because no one ever met her list. And every time she met someone, I said, well, what's wrong with, and she's straight. I said, what's wrong with him? Well, he does this, he does that. I said, well, what about what you do? I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about he doesn't meet my needs. No one ever has. I love her. But she still is single because she chose to not expand. And I would not want that for a lesbian sister. I would say come in being yourself, but understanding that they get to be themselves too. And you meet in the middle. Such powerful and poignant closing remarks from the two of you. As you were talking, I was thinking about a song and it's the the lyrics are this joy I have, the world didn't give it to me, and the world can't take it away. And certainly, what we have um, been talking about to me this this past hour or so has been joy, and just your commitment to it, and knowing it's something that you both have, and no one's going to take it away. Just just beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your life, your love, your legacy, and all this wealth of information. Lynette and Sabrina, thank you for being part of our Black Lesbian Herstory. Thank Thank you you for for having us. us. I mean, wasn't that car story something? It is exciting, isn't it? To be able to share our authentic selves with the world. And that's what we got today in our conversation with Lynette and Sabrina. Did you enjoy it as much as I did? I'm sure you did. It was wonderful. It was full of joy. Wow. Thank you so much, you two, for sharing your story. If you would like to share your story with the Zami Nobla podcast, feel free to contact us. We would also love for you to rate and review the podcast wherever you listen to it. It really helps a lot. So thank you. In the meantime, friends, Review our archive of Black Lesbian Herstory. We've had over 54 episodes now and just a bulk of resources and wealth on Black Lesbian life. I hope you go back and enjoy some other episodes this month. 
In the meantime, my friend, thank you for listening and have a sweet one.